Our Old Testament reading is going to be from Psalm 119. And we go, we're going to focus on verses 81 to 88. 81 to 88. And the Word of God says, My soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. My eyes long for your promise. I ask, when will you comfort me? For I have become like a wineskin in the smoke. Yet I have not forgotten your statutes. How long must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? The insolent have dug pitfalls for me. They do not live according to your law. All your commandments are sure. They persecute me with falsehood. Help me. They have almost made an end of me on earth. But I have not forsaken your precepts. In your steadfast love, give me life, that I may keep the testimonies of your mouth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Father, I pray that you illuminate our minds and, your heart, and our hearts so that we can receive your word. Please help us, help us in times of trial. We thank you for the accomplish redeeming work that your son Jesus Christ has done for us. In your name we pray. Amen. Trials. Who enjoys trials? <laughs> I find it hard to believe that anyone in this room would say, yes, I am excited to suffer. I so look forward to to trials. Well, yet trials have many goals in our lives. For example, we know that the testing of our faith produces steadfastness. We also know that when we encounter different trials, we are sharing Christ's suffering, just as the text that we read from the New Testament. And we also know that God uses our trials for good, and ultimately God uses affliction to conform us into the image of Christ. But after reading the text today, this text from Psalm 119, which by the way is my favorite psalm, we see also a fantastic reality, and that is that God uses trials to draw us closer to himself. Therefore, in times of distress, as we seek God to receive his comfort, he will strengthen us so that we may be a testimony and encouragement to those who also suffer. That you can be prepared to encourage those who are going through trials. So a question that comes to mind is, how can we see God's comfort in times of trial? How? How? Well, we'll see it in three ways. First of all, when we see it when we persevere in the struggle, when you persevere. Secondly, when you experience suffering. And thirdly, when you trust God and his word. So let's focus our attention on the first point, when we persevere in the struggle. Verse 81 says, my soul longs for your salvation. I hope in your word. Throughout Psalm 119, the author has different struggles, and he expresses it very, very vividly. And here we see that he felt that his soul was so spent, was so worn out, and about to end. And th these trials and sufferings were so devastating that all that the author desired was the Lord's salvation. Now, when we talk about salvation in the Old Testament, 80% 80, 80 of the time, we're talking about, uh, we're not referring to justification or redemption. Here, what the psalmist is referring is to God's physical help and intervention to help him as he faced trials. In other words, the psalmist pleads to the Lord to rescue him from his current condition. Uh, you know, I, I can imagine the author says something like, Lord, I am exhausted. I am spent. I'm worn out. I'm fading and almost willing to give up. I have come to an end waiting for your help and your salvation. See, sometimes trials, sometimes we think that trials, for some reason, 
we think that they reduce or become less complicated as we grow mature in the Lord. Oh, well, that's a giant of the faith. I'm sure that he doesn't struggle with sufferings anymore. <laughs> that couldn't be further from the truth. Here we see the opposite. We see a man of God. We see a giant of the faith indicating that trials were so difficult to bear that he was on the verge of giving up. He was fainting as he waited for God's help. Notice that these words don't demonstrate immaturity or a selfish intention to escape from his sufferings. On the contrary, he wasn't looking for the easy way out. But amid his affliction, he had complete confidence that the Lord would sustain him through his word. That's why, I, that's why we read, I hope in your word. Notice how he doesn't question God's plans. He's not saying, what are you doing, Lord? He doesn't stop and say, hey, Lord, I'm waiting for your help. I'm waiting that you get me out of this trial so I don't have to suffer anymore. No, he's not saying that. His faithfulness to God revealed that though trials and afflictions were so devastating, yet his heart and mind remained steadfast in God's word. He didn't know when his discomfort would end. Sometimes we don't know when our trials are going to end, right? It can be a day, two weeks, years. Yet, the psalmist hope and diligently waited in God's word. Here we see the sufficiency of scripture amid trials. But unfortunately, let's be honest, as believers, we seldom act as the psalmist. We often seek comfort and hope elsewhere other than in God's word. We look for temporal means to attenuate our suffering, but forget that the Lord is the one who can give us everlasting comfort. We want to have fun somewhere. We want to get distracted with something. Well, you forget that God is the one who actually is going to give you victory, comfort. And when we don't fix our eyes on Christ and his word, we are in danger to disobey and sin against God. Let me ask you this. Have you ever been in a situation where sufferings, trials are just simply too much to bear? That they cause you to say, Lord, I am exhausted and waiting for your help. I'm done with all of this. Let me tell you, I've been there a lot of times. <laughs> See, in this text, we see that the psalmist shows that despite his trials, despite his suffering, he remained faithful to the Lord. He wasn't just looking for the easy way out. Oh, I just want to get out of this trial. No. Instead, he persevered in his struggle by waiting and hoping in God. Verse 82 says, My eyes long for your promise. I ask, when will you comfort me? Here the word long is the same used in verse 81 when he says, um, when he says, my soul longs for your salvation. It's exactly the same word. And although the meaning is essentially the same, here the word is best understood as exhaustion or extreme fatigue. So we see here that his eyes are exhausted. They're worn out as he took refuge in God's promises. How? How do you take refuge in, in God's promises? By studying his word, by being in the word, by being close to him. It's almost that, that idea that his eyes I felt like they have sand or something because he's been reading the word so much that he's just exhausted. And even though he experienced severe afflictions, he didn't look for an excuse to turn away from God. Nor did he use trials as a pretext to fall into sin. Instead, he persevered in the struggle as he trusted God and his promises. And he fixed his eyes on God's word because he knew that the only source of everlasting comfort comes from God alone. That's why he asks, when will you comfort me? 
He's not saying, when are my friends going to comfort me? He says, when are you going to comfort me? You know, during trials, we often spend more time trying to reason and logically rasp and understand our circumstances. And of course, this is our natural reaction, right? However, at the same time, we should also spend even more time finding comfort in the Lord as we seek to be closer to Him. There will be times when we're not going to understand what's going on. You're not going to understand why you're going through, through such trial. Sometimes suffering is the result of a sinful life. Or it's a discipline from God. But sometimes trials are not a result of a sinful life. God just brings them to your life. And the believer who understands God's sovereign decrees doesn't always seek for specific answers or tries to understand what's going on, but seeks relief and comfort that only God can give through His Spirit and through His Word. And as we receive God's comfort in times of trials, then we are equipped to encourage those brothers and sisters in the faith that are also suffering. Just as we read it on, on the first chapter of 2 Corinthians. And look at this. Look at verse 83. This is so interesting. For I have become like a wineskin in the smoke. Let's stop right there for a moment. Here the word wineskin is very interesting because essentially it's a bottle made out of leather. And these bottles were made for water. And in some cases they were, ma they were made for wine. Yes, wine, not grape juice, okay? They were made for wine or for water. The question is, why is the psalmist using this example? Well, if you're familiar with leather, it cures over time and it dries out. And when it loses all of its moisture, it hardens. And if you expose hardened leather to the sun and to dirt, well, it begins to crack and over time it just breaks. And second, look at the word smoke. This word is so fascinating because it refers to a cloud of smoke caused by a burning fire. So the picture here is of smoke. Uh, it conveys the idea of intense heat. So why is the psalmist using all these words? Because of the in intense struggle and afflictions. His life has dried out as the la leather dries. It's cracking and breaking with the heat of smoke and fire. In other words, trials broke him. Trials breaks us. He was depleted as far as his disposition, energy, emotions, and intentions. You know what was going on with the psalmist? He was depressed. He was depressed. And you know, there are times in life that our trials are so difficult that we're going to fall into depression. And yes, there are going to be some times that probably we're going to need some medical help, some professional help. But ultimately, the true help that we receive in times of trial and depression is God's Word. He's the one who's going to rescue us. He's the one who's going to help us. And the psalmist shows that trials, that these trials were exhausting and he was ready to give up. How many of you have felt this way? I think most of us at some point, right? You don't have to raise your hand. It's not a confessionary in here. <laughs> and you feel, you know, these trials are so intense that you, you look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, man, I just got old. <laughs> I, I, where did this, all this white hair came from? Many of us have felt this way. And the problem, let me tell you this, the, the issue is not necessarily the trial per se. The problem is how you're going to respond to that trial. How are you going to manage it? Notice the psalmist. Notice how he responds. Yet I have not forgotten your statues. This is a response of a man who knows God, who is devoted to him. Here the word forgotten gives the idea when we forget, you know, there are times that we forget certain information and we kind of lose, uh, lose track of it and especially of its meaning. And that leads us to respond in a wrong way. 
So our tendency during trials is to forget and not correctly remember God's statutes. This means that we're, we're, that, that we're prone to forget the commandments that God has specifically prescribed for us that we obey them according to his expectations. You know, we're just so, I don't know the word, but we're just so focused on our suffering that we forget what we're supposed to do in our obedience and our faithfulness to God and his word. Because I'm just thinking about myself. I'm just thinking about my problems. But God has given statutes that you're supposed to obey according to how he wants you to obey them, even if you're suffering, even if we're suffering. And when we forget these statutes, obviously, we end up doing what we think is best <laughs> instead of doing what God wants from us. Nonetheless, we see the author he, he, he knew that God would comfort him through his word. The Holy Spirit enables and directs his people to continue fighting, persevering in the face of struggle as they stand firm in the word. Here the author was more concerned with his faithfulness, obedience, and perseverance in the struggle more than anything else. Yes, the suffering was great. It was exhausting. It was devastating. But he was concerned how he was going to respond. He was remembering God's word. And let me tell you, there will be times that God will expose us to difficult situations that we won't be able to understand what's going on. You're going to be like, what, what, what's going on here? I, 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 from a personal experience, this, this week has been insane for Gabby and I. And it's like, Lord, what, what, what's going on here? You know, God is not going to give us the details, but we know what we're supposed to do as Christians, right? And to, we are supposed to remain faithful. We are supposed to persevere and struggle. So how can we, how, how can we see God's comfort in times of trial? When we persevere in the struggle. And secondly, when we experience suffering. Look at verses 84 and to 80, uh, yeah, verses 84 and 85. How long must your servant endure? When will you judge those who persecute me? The insolent have dug pitfalls for me. They do not live according to your law. See what the author is saying in here? See, do you see those initial words in, verses eight, in verse 84? The author is being transparent. He's not going around the bushes. He isn't playing the martyr's card. He isn't being pretentious. No, he's being himself pleading for divine intervention. I can picture the psalmist saying, Lord, I am your servant, and I know that I'm not going to live forever. How much longer do I have to continue suffering this way? How long must I wait before you punish and judge those persecuting me? I'm sure that many of us have felt this way. Let me, let me tell you, the world has strategically designed and created agendas to persecute and destroy the church. Now more than ever, we are the target. Let me tell you something, church. Now we are considered the terrorists, just so you know. And just as a wolf corners its prey to devour it, these agendas are doing the same thing to the Christian people. And these agendas exist because the world hates God and despises the bride of his son, Jesus. Now, why am I giving this example of the worldly agendas? Notice when he says, those who persecute me. These people weren't just some guys trying to annoy the psalmist. They were not like poking him, ah, making fun of him. No, no, no. These were people who did everything in their power to destroy him. In other words, they persecuted him and hunted him. These persecutors were characterized by having a specific mission and determination, and that was to trap and to eliminate the psalmist. That's why on verse 85, he says, The insolent have dug pitfalls for me. He refers to someone who intentionally made a trap to make him stumble. 
These insolent people are identical and remind me of those who had the determination and the audacity to destroy the prophet Daniel. You guys remember the text, Daniel 6? It's the same, in the same way that the high officials and the satraps wanted to get rid of Daniel, you know, creating this conspiracy, creating laws and everything. Well, the psalmist shows that his enemies sought a way to disqualify him as a child of God, trying to destroy his testimony and reputation, but also they tried to destroy his life. The insolent hate God's people because the very law of the Lord exposes them with their perversity, with their wickedness. They cannot obey God. A wicked person cannot obey God. Nor are they interested in doing so because they're dead in their sins, period. That's why we read, they do not live according to your law. Let me tell you, these insolent are the arrogant, the proud, the presumptuous. That they think, ah, you know, I got it. I can do it by myself. These people are those who have rebelled against God and his word. These are the wicked who have no interest in living in compliance with God's law, but are also intolerant of those who love the Lord and desire to obey him. Isn't that interesting? That sounds very familiar to what we see today. We live in a time and age in which the world demands tolerance. You need to be tolerant to us. <laughs> but they are completely intolerant to anything that is related to God and Christianity. Because God, Jesus Christ, exposes them with their sinful nature. Exposes them with their wickedness. And you know what? I'll be honest. This kind of intolerance to God's statutes, to his word, has infiltrated the church in some way. Yes, it has infiltrated the church. These people, this insolent, are so wicked that they will do everything they can to cause you to stumble. There are people in our churches that they have one mission, to make you stumble. That's why the psalmist pleads and begs the Lord for divine intervention. This is a powerful prayer, brothers and sisters. Notice that although he begged the Lord, the Lord for help, he didn't expect an immediate response. He's like, I need your response right now. No, he was humble. And he was confident in God. Verse 86, all your commandments are sure. They persecute me with falsehood. Help me. A child of God recognizes that his word is faithful and trustworthy. The word sure that we see here in verse 86 that defines God's commandments may be understood as something that's, that is intrinsically perfect. Uh, trustworthy, something reliable. So in other words, we see that God's commandments are perfect, trustworthy, and reliable in the face of any trial. Even when we're willing to give up, when we're so exhausted, I just want to drop the towel, or, where our, or, or when our enemies are trying to attack us and disqualify us, let me tell you this, we must fully trust God and His Word because our hope and security are not based on circumstances, but they're based in our communion with the Lord. If you're putting all your comfort and your happiness and your joy and your circumstances, let me tell you, be ready for a big disappointment. Your comfort has to be in the Lord and His Word. Look what he says, they persecute me with falsehood. Help me. You know, there's nothing worse, and, I, I, and I'm being completely honest with you, there's absolutely nothing worse than to be accused, oppressed, and uh, harassed, persecuted for something that you didn't do. Of course, we are imperfect, you know, the Lord is still working in our sanctification, but it, it's awful when you're accused of something that you are not responsible for. But it is more devastating when people inside the church persecute you with lies, with gossip and slander, and they do everything to destroy who you are. Yes, inside the church. 
And if you don't believe me, if you don't believe me that this is possible, then you need to go to church more often. <laughs> because it happens. It happens. It happened to Gabby and I, by the way. And it, ha it has happened to pretty much every pastor that I've ever met. There are people inside the church that they're just there to destroy other people's lives. And in many cases, these people's motives are based just on envy and jealousy. Because they see that God, that you have something that they cannot have. And here the psalmist experienced this. His enemies didn't even have a legitimate reason to destroy him. All their intentions were born from anger, fury, hatred, jealousy, you name it. And these words honestly remind me of what our Lord Jesus Christ went through. In the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, verses 55 to 56, says, you don't have to go there. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. And we'll look, listen to this. But they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. They conspired against Jesus because they couldn't find any guilt or sin to accuse him. So they made lies. They created this narrative. And they did everything in their power to crucify him. And they did. But it was according to what scripture had prophesied. Notice how the psalmist responds. You know, these enemies are making lies about him, about his person. They want to destroy him. They want to kill him. Look how he responds. Help me. Help me. By the way, what does the word help me? Do you know what the word help me in Hebrew means? It means help me. He's asking for help. And sometimes when we suffer, let's be honest, when we're in the midst of trials, the first thing that we do is we go and complain to a brother or sister in the faith. And we ask for people's help. Yes, there's a logic behind it. You know, there's emergencies, I know. But if there's something that God is specifically working with you, go directly to him. And understand that you have no control over your circumstances. Sometimes, honestly, I regret for not taking the same assessment that the psalmist did, trying to fix things on my own instead of going with the one who has sovereign control of over all things. The psalmist is honest and pleads for help. And what I love about this is notice how he doesn't respond vindictively. He's not going to be like, you see, I'm going to see you at the end. At the end of lunch, I'll see you outside. No, he's trusting God. He's asking for divine help. Verse 87, they have almost made an end of me on earth. This section in the original is actually very interesting because the word they have made an end is the same word long that has been used in the first uh, in verses 81 and 82. And in this verse, uh, what he means is that these people almost destroyed his life. Uh, to put it in a, in a colloquial way, they almost wasted him, <laughs> destroyed him. And we see that these attacks, the persecution and the trials that the psalmist experienced were, weren't just simply spiritual. It wasn't just a spiritual intimidation or harassment or emotional. It was also physical. His physical life was in, in, in imminent danger. And yet, despite this overwhelming trial, his response, notice his response, but I have not forsaken your precepts. Here in the original, the author is actually being emphatic, and he's saying, but as for myself, I have not forsaken your precepts. Even though his enemies made him suffer, even though they tried to destroy and to disqualify him, even though he walked through the valley of the shadow of death and experienced the darkest moments in his life, 
Guess what? He feared no evil because he knew that the Lord was with him. And he also didn't forsake God's word. Here the word precepts of God referred to his commandments and those instructions that he wants us to obey step by step according to his standards, to what he wants. Not according to what you think is good for you, but it's according to what he wants from you, from us. Let me tell you, when we face uh, different trials, especially when we are under attack by other people, especially by God's enemies, we use such situations and afflictions as excuse to take action in our own hands, to take revenge. Uh, There are times that, of course, there's extreme times that you do have to protect your loved ones. I agree with that. But sometimes we get so into our heads that we forget and even neglect God's word on purpose. Because I want to feel, I have to have the control of everything. We are control freaks, honestly. (laughs) That's what we are by nature. But the psalmist's response as he experienced this suffering was to remain faithful to God and his word. And what I love about this is that we have our supreme and perfect example of faithfulness. And guess who? And our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord Jesus Christ remained faithful until the end to accomplish redemption. When he was wrongly accused and slandered, our Lord remained silent. He wasn't telling him, you know, I'm going to get you later. I'm going to kill you. No. <laughs> he, kept, he kept his mouth shut. He didn't say anything. Just as scripture prophesied. He remained faithful to the plan of redemption and humbly submitted to the will of the Father, knowing that through his life, his death and resurrection, he would redeem his bride, his church. And because the Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in us, we are confident that we have everything. Brothers and sisters, we have everything to also remain faithful to him amid trials. May I have an amen? Thank you. Thank you, brother. We have everything. The problem is that sometimes we don't act. We don't want to act. And we just want to run away. But we see here the psalmist that he experienced suffering. And as he experienced, he saw God's comfort in times of trial. So first of all, we see that God's comfort trials of tire, the tri- times of trial, excuse me. Uh, we can see it when we persevere in the struggle, when we experience suffering. And finally, when we trust God and his word. When we trust God and his word. Verse 88, in your steadfast love, Give me life that I may keep the testimonies, testimonies of your mouth. Here the word steadfast love is just, I, I have no words to explain how beautiful this word is because it's the word chesed. And the word chesed is the strongest form of love, of grace, mercy, loyalty, and kindness that can be demonstrated and expressed in a covenant relationship. There's no other stronger way to to, to show that kind of loving kindness. It's this word. That's it. And, and, And actually, sometimes it's translated as loving kindness or mercy. This is the perfect love, the perfect grace, the faithfulness and goodness that God pours down on his children. Look at it. Look at this. The psalmist is suffering, and yet he remembers that covenant grace. That's the response of a man of God. Everything is falling apart, yet you're here with me, Lord. You're here with me. And ultimately, this kind of chesed, Stephas love, was demonstrated through our Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for us. Here the word, give me life, conveys the idea of reviving, of giving energy or strength. How many of you are familiar with the commercial energizer with a bunny? 
it went, well, maybe, I don't know if they show it nowadays, but back in the 90s, uh, it was pretty common to see the little bunny, a pink bunny, you know, very excited, and then when he ran out of battery, what happened? He kind of died. Not exactly, but he just lost all his energy. And then when a person put the energizer battery, what happened? Oh, he was again going from one place to another, just hitting the tambourine, or I don't know what it was, a drummer. The idea that the psalmist is giving here when he says, give me life, is that of being recharged. The psalmist asks God to give his life back, to revitalize him, and to revitalize all his disposition according to the faithful grace and steadfast love that the Lord has demonstrated thus far in his affliction. Imagine. I, I can imagine those trials must have been so devastating that he's just like, you know what? I, I need you to recharge me, Lord, because this is just too much. This is just too much. I need your help. We see the author pleading with the Lord for comfort in times of trial. And we see these words. Uh, now, let me ask you this. Well, actually, let me say this. These words were written under the Old Covenant. And now that we are in the new and better covenant, how much more should we be clinging to Christ for help to recharge us in times of trial? The psalmist says, Lord, please strengthen me. Give me life and energy according to your covenantal eternal grace for me. We see here that amid suffering, the believer must run and take refuge in God's love, in his word, in his son. And notice that the psalmist asks to be revived according to God's steadfast love with one purpose in mind, with one goal. He wasn't thinking, revive me so I can just go outside and I can keep playing and doing my thing. No, 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 no. He's not saying that. And I will keep the testimony of your now, the purpose of being revitalized and strengthened by God's steadfast love is to remain faithful to his word and to him. He, div- he pleads for this divine inter- inter- intervention. And interestingly, look, look at this. Look, just, we're, we're about to finish. But look at this when he says the testimonies of your mouth. Uh, he doesn't say the testimonies of your word or, or your commandments or statutes. No, no, no. He, 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 he's alluding to the Torah. He's alluding to the Pentateuch, to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 8, 3. Man will not live by bread alone, but by all that comes out of the mouth of the Lord will man live. And it's very interesting because that text is quoted by our Lord Jesus in Matthew 4, 4. And we see a marvelous Christ-centered reality here, a parallel. Just as Jesus trusted and rested upon God's word to overcome temptation and trial and testing, so also the psalmist knew that he would be victorious and would receive God's comfort as he trusted God's testimonies. This is an incredible witness to us during times of trial. The ultimate source that God has provided for us so that we can depend on him, is his word. You know, for many years I thought I could find comfort in other places. I had my little cat who actually passed away a couple weeks ago, actually over a month ago now. Wow, time flies. He was always by my side. But you know what? Scripture reminds me that God has provided something greater and divine. His son, Jesus Christ, his word. That gives us absolute comfort. God allows trials in our life not to push us away from himself, but to draw us closer to himself. His son Jesus has finished everything on our behalf, and we have absolute comfort and peace in him. And when times of trial are too difficult to bear, and we're on the verge of depression and ready to give up, just remember Jesus' words in Matthew 11 verses 28 to 30. Listen to this. Come to me. Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. 
Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. This is God's comfort in times of trial. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Father, trials are just such an interesting thing, and yet we know that you use them to conform us into the image of your Son. And as we continue struggling and experience suffering and remaining faithful to you, Father, I just pray that you continue to, for, uh, to conform us into the image of your Son. Thank you for trials, even though they're so difficult and sometimes they're devastating, yet, Lord, you've provided your word and you've provided your son to receive the penalty that we deserve, but also to live the life that we were supposed to live. He did everything on our behalf. And now we can come to you and call you Abba Father. So we thank you for these difficult times, knowing that you will comfort us. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you.